Hello, everyone, and welcome to this third session of this four-part webinar series on measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide from space in support of climate studies. Today's session will be about global and regional carbon cycle studies using OCO2 and OCO3 data. And uh, this is Erica Pota speaking. I am an instructor with the RCEP program. And I am very pleased to introduce to you our guest speaker today. His name is Dr. Abhishek Chatterjee, and he is OCO3 project scientist, well as well as OCO deputy project scientist. And he's based at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So thank you very much, Dr. Chatterjee, for your presentation and for sharing your expertise with us today. The floor is all yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Abhishek Chatterjee. I'm a scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I'm also the project scientist for NASA's OCO3 mission and the deputy project scientist for NASA's OCO2 mission. Today, we'll be going over the part three of the XCO2 training session that several of you have been attending. And what we will cover in part three today is the different ways in which OCO2 and OCO3 data is being used to understand global and regional carbon cycle, carbon climate feedbacks, as well as how the carbon cycle is responding to different natural or human-induced perturbations. Now, just to give you all a quick recap, I will be briefly touching upon some of the ways in which XCO2 is measured or retrieved that you already covered in part one. And then if you recall in part two, we talked about how you can access and visualize that data. Today, you will be learning about how you use that data to advance different scientific investigations in support of global and regional climate related studies. So to the overall outline for this talk will be that we'll do a quick recap of OCO2 and OCO3 measurements. I'll then give a quick overview of the carbon cycle to make you better understand the different space and time scales over which carbon cycle operates and what we can really constrain from the OCO2 and OCO3 measurements. Then I will talk about some of the higher order products that we need to derive from the OCO2 and OCO3 measurements in order to get an understanding of how the carbon cycle is responding to different changes, whether that be related to climate or human-induced perturbations. Then finally, we'll see a few different case studies or examples of how this XCO2 data has been applied. I will cover three specific topics. The first one where we talk about or where we look at studies that have specifically investigated the exchange of CO2 fluxes between the land surface and the atmosphere or the ocean surface and the atmosphere. Second, we will look at studies that have tried to understand the response of the carbon cycle to climate patterns and variability. And specifically here, I'll be talking about the 2015-2016 El Nino, La Nina Southern Oscillation event that happened that had a huge impact on global um, carbon cycle. And then finally, I'll be talking about the response of carbon cycle to human-induced perturbations. So for example, specifically, I'll be talking about how emissions reductions happened during the COVID-19 pandemic and whether that signal was detectable from our space-based instruments. Now to begin with a quick recap and reminding you of all how OCO2 and OCO3 measurements. Um, OCO2 has now been providing more than seven and a half years of data record, whereas OCO3 has a much shorter data record spanning only two and a half years. Uh, both OCO2 and OCO2 pretty much have the same mission, which is to retrieve estimates of the column average dry year mole fraction of carbon dioxide. This is what we call as XCO2. And they retrieve these XCO2 with precision better than one part per million. And then the idea is that we can use this XCO2 data to understand processes at scales uh, of 
region to global, so going all the way from hundreds of kilometers to the entire global scale. Both now, just to also remind you all of how OCO2 and OCO3 takes data, there are three specific modes in which OCO2 and OCO3 take data, that being nadir, where the instrument is looking down at the surface, as you see on this first diagram at the bottom. The second is the glint mode, where the instrument takes data by specularly, by looking at the surface from where sunlight is being specularly reflected. So that is known as a glint mode. And then the third one is a target mapping mode in which measurements are taken over specific locations on the ground. Now there is a fourth mode called the snapshot area mapping mode that is very unique to OCO3. And this is made possible by an extremely uh, agile pointing mirror assembly. What this does, this snapshot area mapping mode or what we typically call a SAM mode, what this does is that imagine a square or a rectangle which is about 80 kilometers by 80 kilometers or even 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. We take continuous data over that particular rectangle or square within a period of two minutes and we essentially map that entire area by taking this very dense and rich density of XCO2 soundings. So this SAM area mode then becomes really useful for understanding how emissions are changing across different cities, over power plants, over urban areas. And you'll actually be hearing a lot about the SAM mode at the next RCEP training session, uh, that is session four. Now, this is again, a couple of videos that you have already seen before, but this is just to give you or remind you again uh, about the, how OCO2 and OCO3 operates, the measurements they are taking, the global nature, and then the differences between the two. OCO2 being a polar orbiter is able to get coverage across the full globe, like all the way from the north to the south. Of course, there is some seasonal sampling bias. Uh, so for example, during the winter time, we actually get more measurements over the Southern hemisphere, Whereas during the summertime, those measurements shift off and we get coverage all the way going up to the northern high latitudes. OCO3, on the other hand, being on the International Space Station, is bound by this 52 north to 52 south latitude. Now, the data from these two instruments have actually featured in over 400 publications till date, um, and those number of publications are still going. So there is a huge database if you want to go back and look up some of these studies that I'll be referring to later, there is a huge database already that exists. Uh, these studies have been used to understand global and regional carbon cycle interactions, response of the carbon cycle to climate patterns, response of the carbon cycle to extreme regional events, um, and then also look at under, uh, quantification of CO2 emissions from human activities. Again, the focus of this talk will be on this first bullet point here. So more on the global and regional carbon cycle interactions and those studies, whereas the one focused on anthropogenic or human induced activities, those will happen in the next training session. So now let's begin with just an overview of the carbon cycle and how it is evolving and how it is changing. This is a really nice figure or a really nice video showing the changes in atmospheric CO2 concentrations. This was put together by Dr. Andrew Jacobson um, at NOAA, who's one of our close colleagues. And what this video really shows is that on the map right here, all these blinking dots, those are different locations where we do have ground-based measurements of atmospheric CO2. Now, very early on, there were actually two stations that were put in. One is Mauna Loa, which is in the red dot, and then the other one is South Pole, which is in the blue dot. And just the data from these two sites, over time, they were robust enough that three signals came, became visible very early on. First, that there is an upward trend, that is, there is a continuous rise in atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Second, that there is a seasonal cycle, and you can essentially see that by how noisy the measurements are around the northern hemisphere measurement that's around the red dot at Mauna Loa, versus almost no variability that is at the southern hemisphere and the blue dot. And 
the third is that there is also this very strong north-south gradient that becomes evident again because more and more of the emissions are happening in the northern hemisphere and very much fewer emissions in the southern hemisphere so this brings us to the question of like why and how are these co2 concentrations rising the main point being that human activities especially fossil fuel extraction and fossil fuel emissions that is sort of what is causing this continuous upward rise in annuals in co2 emissions which is shown in the black line here alongside there is another human activity that actually tends to release a lot of co2 in the atmosphere and that is any kind of land use and land cover change especially deforestation logging etc now while both of these are emissions that are happening into this of emissions that are happening into the atmosphere it turns out that the atmospheric growth rate or the atmospheric concentration of co2 doesn't necessarily rise at the same magnitude as the fossil fuel emissions uh, there is an upward trend for sure but there is a lot of variability in that atmospheric co2 measurements and this sort of the fact that the atmospheric co2 concentrations are almost 50 percent of the total rise that is made possible due to the discount we get from the land and the ocean the land and the oceans take up large amounts of co2 and essentially they tend to temper the sort of steep rise that we have in fossil fuel emissions this diagram provides a very quick overview of the land and the ocean reservoirs and all the different processes that are occurring so within the land some of the key processes that we will refer to throughout the stock and you will also hear in, in the future when you are talking or thinking about carbon cycle are photosynthesis where the plants take up co2 from the atmosphere and respiration and or decomposition which tends to release co2 in the atmosphere now if you look at the global numbers if you look on the right side here if you look at the global numbers then the emissions and the removals from the land they are pretty much balanced or in pretty much synced with each other similarly for the ocean there are different types of pumps that occur from the biological pump controlling photosynthesis and decomposition as well as a solubility pump and again the ocean is pretty much in balanced with each other in terms of the emissions that happen and the removals that happen however the piece uh, which is not shown in the diagram but was there on the previous slide and which is completely unbalanced are the human activities which tends to emit co2 in the atmosphere and that is sort of one of them that is the primary cause why co2 concentrations are rising now one of the fascinating facts about carbon cycle is that we have a great understanding of these processes as they occur at the global scale but then there are sort of different space and time scales at which we can be thinking about this problem. So we can obviously start with the global scale where there are changes in the carbon cycle that are happening over centuries and over several decades. But then you can kind of take a step back and think about a much smaller scale. So let's say at the scale of a country. So for example, here I've shown a map of the lower 48 states in the United States or CONUS and we can just think about the different carbon cycle processes that are occurring at this scale we can take a step further back and just think about in terms of regions so for example just hundreds of kilometers let's say a mountain region or the scale of a city and the specific carbon cycle processes that occurred there or go one step further down and think about the carbon cycle that's occurring uh, in terms of the tree that is standing the photosynthesis respiration sort of uh, lead lift litter and decomposition etc or you can go up another step back and just think about the processes that are occurring at very fine scale at the scale of a leaf each individual leaf actually has a photosynthesis and respiration going on and we can try and understand the carbon cycle at that scale so there is this huge variation going almost from the leaf level all the way to the global scale carbon cycle kind of links all those scales is occurring at all of those scales this brings us to sort of what are the most pressing questions in carbon cycle science what i have done in this particular figure here 
is that on the x-axis, I have shown the different scales at which carbon cycle can occur, uh, occur. Some specific examples we saw in the previous slide. So going from the plot or the lab laboratory scale, all the way going up to the global scale. On the y-axis here, I have the different time scales over which carbon cycle is occurring or operating. For example, over the day, as like in the morning when there is sunlight, there is a lot of uptake that's happening by the trees, but then as nighttime falls and photosynthesis stops, there is a release of CO2 that happens. Or this can be occurring at the seasonal scale. So for example, between in summer, going from April, May, all the way up to like, let's say, uh, September, October, that's when it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere, all the leaves are thriving and there is a lot more uptake that's happening. Versus the winter when it might be snowing, uh, it's very cold and almost the carbons, uh, there is not much action happening from the land biosphere at all. Or we can go up to the interannual scale, which spans like the changes that are happening from year to year or decadal scale, so over the period of a decade or centuries. And there are like different processes that are occurring at all of these scales, and some of them are noted in the table down below. And I have then sort of also highlighted which particular grid cell that falls into. So for example, if you are trying to think about the response of carbon cycle, uh, let's take an example to water stress events, or for example, droughts or floods, then these are typically processes that are occurring at the regional or ecosystem scale. Uh, and then in terms of time scale, the flash floods or something can happen over the course of a day, or it can happen, uh, floods, bigger floods can happen over the uh, course of a season, or it can change from year to year where you have drought in one year, and then in the next two years, you might have flood and then again drought. And so, the response of carbon cycle to water stress events that ends up sort of falling in this space and time scale domain which is ranging from regional ecosystem and covering these time scales here from diurnal to interannual now why do we want to break up carbon cycle science in this way is the primary reason is that there are certain space and time scales that are very well understood which are highlighted in green uh, there are some that are not understood well at all, which are highlighted in orange boxes. And then there are some where we have intermediate under understanding, but we are trying to use our measurements to obtain a better understanding. And the main takeaway from this uh, long slide is that OCO2 and OCO3 measurements, the XCO2 measurements and the solar induced fluorescence measurements that we take, they are well equipped to provide understanding of the carbon cycle questions at scales in this shaded portion. So starting a little bit a little bit bigger than a trees, we can't look at individual trees, but we can look at a patch of land and have an understanding there, going all the way up to the global scale. And then similarly, we can have understanding at weekly scales, so a little bit larger than a day, but then going up to like not a decade yet because we don't have that long a time record, but at least going up to seven, eight years and sort of the changes that are happening. So this is kind of fundamental as you as we look through the different studies and the different examples and the next few slides, it's sort of important to understand or sort of keep in mind, uh, keep in the back of your mind, this space and time scale configuration. Like as I mentioned, a study, whether that falls in this regional scale or a continental scale study, whether that's at the interannual or seasonal, et cetera. So now before we look at the studies, I do want to highlight that we actually uh, tend to take the XCO2 data and then uh, do some value added framework in to generate what we call as level three and level four carbon fluxes. So what are these level three and level four products? The reason why we want to make these data products or higher order value added data products is because the level two data has have gaps. There are missing soundings due to cloud cover or thick aerosol layer. And we already saw an example or several demonstrations of them in the previous two training sessions. 
the level three product, on the other hand, essentially tends to spatially gap fill these uh, this XCO2 data and create this very nice, almost like a 3D, so kind of lap long time, this 3D gap fill product, typically at grids of 50 to 100 kilometer in latitude and longitude. So this provides a very nice, clear view of changes in atmospheric CO2 uh, concentrations. The level four product is one step further where we then take this XCO2 information. This can either be directly the level two data or the level three data, and we put them together through an inverse modeling uh, framework in order to generate what we call as fluxes. So the exchange of CO2 between the land and the atmosphere or the ocean and the atmosphere. These again are again typically delivered in grids of a little bit longer, a little bit larger than what we have for the level three product, but going from 100 to 500 kilometer in latitude and longitude. And so just as an example, this is sort of, for example, what we have for the level two product. This is just one snapshot in time shown from August 2018. Notice some of the large gaps that we have across the globe, uh, specifically over this region and uh, over India and Southeast Asia. This is the monsoon season, and so there is a lot of cloud cover during this time, and likely, which is why we do not have a lot of measurements available. The level three product will take this information and then use statistical and other modeling tools to generate this nice gap filled map. And so notice that those data gaps that were there, those have now been actually filled. Again, making sure that the data uh, the estimates that we obtain in this region, they have uncertainty bounds, and those estimates are obtained in a statistically rigorous manner, which is consistent with the data from the level two product. The level four product then take, can take data either from level two or from level three, put it through an inverse modeling framework, and I'll explain that in a minute, and generate the CO2 flux map. So again, note that even though we had data gaps that were there in the level two product over the Southeast Asia Indian Ocean region, we are actually still able to infer fluxes over that region uh, because those have been statistically gap filled. The inverse modeling uh, framework that I mentioned, which is what we use to generate the level four fluxes, this is actually a complex piece of mathematical uh, modeling framework. The main idea here is that we want to use information about atmospheric CO2 observations, merge that with information about atmospheric transport, and generate uh, or estimate CO2 flux that then matches this observed atmospheric CO2 concentrations. So there are a lot of mathematical nuances and mathematical steps that go into it, which I'm unable to cover in this uh, short session that we have today, but I can certainly point you to references or some of the references that I have later. If you look through them, you will find some excellent references or sources in the literature that you can refer to. Um, but the basic idea is that we start with some prior knowledge of CO2 fluxes in the atmosphere. We then move them through an atmospheric transport model and generate what we call as simulated measurements of atmospheric CO2. So they are not the real ones, but some simulated measurements. We then compare them against the actual observations of CO2 that we have taken from OCO2, OCO3, or from some ground-based station. We look at the difference between the observations and the simulations, and then try to reduce that mismatch between the two through this inverse modeling process. This then allows us to actually correct this prior knowledge of CO2 fluxes that we have and generate a estimate of posterior CO2 fluxes which is sort of then consistent with the observations that were taken. Again, this is a pretty big and complex mathematical framework, and I'd be happy to talk about it during the question and answer session or point you to references uh, that you can kind of look up on this topic. A few terminology that I want to clear before uh, we get into the studies. First is what we call as a net biosphere exchange. Uh, this is sort of what we actually estimate when we run this inverse modeling problem. It is an exchange of net flux of carbon between the terrestrial biosphere and the atmosphere. 
because the atmospheric observations that we are using are XCO2, that is actually integrating information from all different sources and all different components and seeing the full column. This flux that we derive that already includes information about, for example, biomass burning or deforestation um, or any kind of other disturbances or recovery from disturbances. So any and all changes that are happening, the atmosphere is observing that. And because we use those observations, we are able to capture that in the exchange. Now, what we typically do not capture are the fossil fuel and cement emissions or the fossil fuel emissions. And that is because when we typically use these observations from OCO2 uh, or OCO3, we typically tend to back out or keep that separate, the fossil fuel emission estimates separate. Um, a third product that we typically deliver is then called the net carbon exchange or NCE. And this is the net flux of carbon between the surface and the atmosphere, which actually takes into account information from the net biosphere exchange and fossil fuel to generate this estimate. So now, before, uh, as we jump into the different studies that have been conducted, um, the specific case studies or examples that I will show uh, will pertain uh, to some of the topics that are listed here. So, for example, changes that are happening at the global to continental scales, at regional scales, then look at the carbon cycle response to 2015-2016 El Nino uh, and the 2019-2020 bushfires, and then finally try to understand the impact on atmospheric CO2 concentrations due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So moving on to the first study here, which is just trying to get a better understanding of what the net flux exchange between the land and the ocean and the atmosphere is across the globe, uh, but then also looking at spatial and temporal variations. So spatially, how different are the northern extratropics from the tropics versus uh, temporally, like how does this net flux exchange vary between different years? So this is a map that has been produced by looking at the XCO2 data from OCO2, then running that information through an inverse modeling framework, and then generating estimates of this net flux exchange. There are six maps here showing the net flux exchange going all the way from 2015. So this is like an annual map or annual average of the 2015 net flux exchange, and then going up to 2020. Um, and as you just sort of like look across this maps from 2015 all the way up to 2020, there are a few things that should catch your eye. So for example, wherever you're seeing this blue, uh, that typically signifies carbon uptake that's happening by the land. And so typically in the Northern hemisphere at this uh, Northern extra tropics where you do have a lot more forest, in general, that area is a net sink over an annual scale. On the other hand, a look at the tropics, for example, or especially like this particular region in the Amazon or a little bit over the Sahel region and uh, places in South Asia. Those areas are always lit up as red, which means that there is more carbon being released by the land and the ocean rather than uptake. So there are sort of these interesting dynamics or interesting patterns that happen between the northern extra tropics and the tropical lands. And by looking at these maps, scientists are then able to better get a exchange, get a better idea or better idea of the exchange that's happening between these different regions and the atmosphere and what type of modifications we kind of need to make. Now the OCO science team routinely generates these estimates as a part of um, what we call as a modeling intercomparison or MIP activity. And I've noted a couple of references here to published studies that you can look up to stare at these maps as we have used different sets of XCO2 data and different experiments and sensitivity tests that are done. Um, now that was provided a great visualization at the global scale, but what about if you want to know about the flux exchange that is happening at the regional scale? Well, it turns out, yes, we can address that component as well. This is a study from uh, 
Philip et al. 2022, so a very recent study that actually looked at the flux exchange over the small region of South Asia, specifically around India. And what they also did was not just look at the flux exchanges estimated from the OCR2 data, but then also compared it to flux exchanges estimated by some ground-based stations, which are shown in the red dots here. And one of the fascinating things, as we have been learning more and more about the flux exchange at different scales, is that typically when we do this inverse modeling process or generate this inverse modeling estimates from satellite data, they are slightly different from the estimates that we can have at the, at the from the ground-based data. And the reason for that are twofold. The first one is that the satellite data is actually giving a much higher density or a much greater spatial coverage um, than what we have from the ground-based data. And then the second is that the satellite is also seeing the full total column. So we are seeing all the exchanges that are happening at the surface, close to the surface, all the way up to the atmosphere. Whereas the ground-based data has a much smaller vertical representation. So it's able to see some of the flux exchanges that are happening close to the surface, but if there are any kind of information coming from outside, uh, it's not really able to capture that. These two reasons end up causing that there is some difference in estimate that we obtain uh, from the two. And one of the big activities within the carbon cycle science community is to reconcile the estimates from these two different inverse modeling frameworks. Uh, one using the satellite and one using the ground-based data. All these studies that I have mentioned, uh, the previous two that I mentioned, Crowell et al. and Piero et al., as well as the Philip et al. study, all of them, when you look to them, you will find that they have provided estimates from the ground-based data as well as estimates from the satellite data, and then extensive discussions on why they are different and how we can better reconcile them. What type of activities do we need or what type of uh, special tasks we need to launch upon to better merge those two estimates together. Now, as I, I mentioned earlier that we, what we estimate directly from the satellite data, that's a net bias for exchange, but then if we add the fossil fuel emission, then we can get at something called the net carbon exchange. And it is this net carbon exchange that is now shown here. We started off by taking the net bus for exchange from the OCO2 data, added in estimates of fossil fuel, and have now generated this NC estimates that actually you can see the mean uh, over the entire globe on this uh, on the left hand side, and then the uncertainty on the right hand side. And what we have done is that instead of looking at the estimates on like a one by one grid, we have then also kind of broken it up into country totals so that, for example, you can see the net carbon exchange happening over the US or over Brazil or over India, et cetera, instead of having this uh, one by one finer scale map. Um, I will point out that we had another RCET training on the global stock take, which is a current uh, framework that's kind of currently underway and trying to understand uh, CO2 budgets, and this is part of our contribution to the UNFCCC global uh, stock take process that's happening, where we look at this top-down atmospheric CO2 budgets, complement them with bottom-up inventories, and provide uh, this a very accurate and transparent map of how much CO2 is changing uh, or of the CO2 budget uh, over a particular country. This actually satisfies Article 14 of the Paris Agreement. I will point out that there was a previous RCET training that recently concluded on how we develop these budgets, what the implications are to support the global stock take, and I would strongly encourage all of you to take a look at that training session as well. So that piece pretty much covered some of the flux exchange studies that we are having at the global and the regional scale. Moving on to the next set of studies, which is trying to understand the response of the carbon cycle to climate patterns and variability. And the first one that I'm going to cover is that the 2015-2016 El Nino event, 
which had a huge impact on the carbon cycle. Now, what is an El Nino to begin with? Uh, an El Nino is a climate pattern that describes unusual warming of surface waters in the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. So, for example, in this region of the Pacific Ocean, uh, if you can see my cursor, that's where there is like this unusual warming that happens. This happens uh, at, I would say, some would say at like pretty regular intervals, uh, but somewhere between a uh, two to three year up to like seven year time period. It's a very cyclical event. And when that happens, because there are so many teleconnections between the atmosphere and the ocean, especially over the tropics, when this warming happens or a, it's, it's a lot of cooling happens over this region, that actually sets up a large amount of global and regional weather and climate anomalies. Like this will impact your ocean temperatures, the speed and strength of the ocean currents, which then has an impact on uh, weather from tropics to extra tropics, as well as to socioeconomic systems, for example, coastal fisheries and their health, etc. Um, there are a lot of great resources on the web if you want to learn more about this El Nino event and sort of the different uh, regional and local impacts that it has. And so I've uh, put in a link here uh, for that. Now, how does this impact the carbon cycle? Well, this is an animation here that is actually showing those warming of waters over the coast of the, over the tropical Pacific uh, for the 2015 event as it was happening, and then comparing it to another massive El Nino event that we had in back 97, 98. The, because this particular region is again so strongly connected to the atmosphere and there are so many teleconnections that are taking place, it turns out that ENSO is a big driver of interannual variability in the carbon cycle. And in fact, studying the response of how CO2 concentrations vary with El Nino, that uh, studies have attempted that going all the way back to the 1970s. But what really uh, proved a big impediment or a big challenge was that there weren't a lot of great ground measurements to validate or support our hypothesis. We could see that when an El Nino event happens, so for example, in 97, 98, or even this 2015, there is typically a rise in atmospheric CO2 concentrations, but then how much of that is coming from the ocean, how much of that is coming from the land, and where on the land these responses are taking place, it was really difficult to get a, a sense or understanding of those causal mechanisms. Um, now, the El Nino system and one of the big areas where it actually has an impact on the carbon cycle is in the tropical Pacific itself. The tropical Pacific is actually a very interesting place uh, for looking at the carbon cycle because it is one of the few ocean regions where you actually do have a release of CO2 in the atmosphere. You heard that right. It's actually a release of CO2 in the atmosphere. During normal conditions, uh, and which is kind of shown on this figure on the schematic on the left hand side, there is an upwelling of cold subsurface waters that have really high potential peak CO2. In addition, the biological pump over this region is pretty inefficient. And as a result, there is a release of CO2 outgassing that normally happens during the, uh, this time. On the other hand, when you have El Nino conditions, there is a lot more warming of the surface temperature uh, of the ocean temperature and as a result it almost caps this thermocline or thermocline of the gradient that you have between the deeper cold water and the uh, warmer surface waters this thermocline getting capped this actually reduces the upwelling and there are a couple of other changes that are happening for example the typically the winds that kind of blow and disturb the surface um, quite counterintuitively, the biological pump actually becomes a little bit more efficient. And during an El Nino, what then ends up happening is that this release of CO2 that was happening from the tropical Pacific, that decreases by almost 40 to 60 percent. Now, this phenomenon, this has been theoretically studied as well as studied by taking actual measurements into the ocean. So people actually drop different sounds or different instruments into the waters of the ocean and take measurements and so this is both 
theoretical as well as observed and validated this particular phenomenon. The issue here is that we actually previous to OCO2 or before OCO2, we were never able to observe it or validate it from our atmospheric CO2 measurements. And that's what OCO2 allowed us to do. So this is actually a figure from this paper, uh, Chatterjee et al. in 2017 that came out in science, which shows this particular region over the tropical Pacific, what are also called as the Nino regions, the 2015 2016 event now each el nino event i should say is actually very different uh, it can occur over the central pacific it can occur a little bit more on the eastern pacific side um, but the 2015 2016 event that happened was primarily kind of one focused around the central pacific or nino 3.4 region what is shown on the right hand side here are two different panels the top panel is basically showing the different of what we call as indicators of ENSO, so the Oceanic Nino Index or the Southern Oscillation Index. Um, they are shown as two different lines. Now, these ENSO indicators are primarily used to understand or uh, sort of qualitatively get a sense of when the beginning of the El Nino event happened and then when it ends. And so it turned out that for 2015, 2016 event, the beginning happened sometime around this April May of 2015 period. That's when the onset of the El Nino events kicked off. It reached its peak over the winter of that year. So getting into between October, November, all the way up to February 2016. And then by the end of April or May of 2016, the El Nino event had ended. So as we kind of embark on this period, you can see that there is this gradual sort of rise in this particular one oceanic Nino index, uh, which reaches this peak of the winter and then dies down. The bottom panel now actually shows the anomalies calculated from the OCR2 data corresponding to this for the same time period over this particular Nino 3.4 region. And there are sort of like really two fascinating pieces that pop up. The first one is that during this onset phase of El Nino, you can see that there is actually a reduction in those XCO2s anomalies, whereas as we get into the later stages of the peak phase, there is actually an increase in the XCO2 that tends to happen. So the question that we had was, is this valid? Does this make sense? And it turns out that yes, this onset reduction in XCO2 that we have during this onset phase, that actually corresponds to when the ocean starts responding. So remember what we talked about in the previous slide is that in normal conditions, there's a lot of CO2 outgassing that happens from the ocean, which then reduces by 40 to 60% when El Nino conditions happen. So the, what we are capturing here is basically the response of the ocean. But then once we get past that, the land actually kicks in. There are a lot more fires that start happening over Indonesia, as well as in general, there are drought conditions that spread across the tropics, and that results in sort of uh, the land being less of a sink. And so what we are seeing here that is the rise in XCO2 concentration, that's primarily happening due to the land response. The reduction in CO2 outgassing from the tropical Pacific um, there are now several studies that have actually looked at trying to get an estimate of how much the uh, reduction happened. What I'm showing here on the figure is sort of like a long term. Uh, the X axis shows this time series going all the way back from 95 to 2018. We are looking at again that small Nino 3.4 region over the tropical Pacific, and we are looking at estimates from different um, models. Um, the ones shown in the red, blue, and the green line, these are all different class of ocean models that try to estimate the ARC flux exchange. And pretty much all of them show that during 2015-16, there was this large reduction that happened in the outgassing of CO2. Um, those estimates are around particular magnitude, 0.12 plus minus 0.6. The estimates that we obtained from our OCO2 is sort of roughly sort of false within that um, estimate, but it seems a little bit higher around 
And then a third way that we have estimated the CO2 outgassing is based on shipboard data estimates. So what is shown in this map are sort of different ships as they are uh, going across the ocean or different ocean regions. They actually have several different sensors that are put on them. A lot of them actually carry sensors that are looking at the PCO2 or the CO2 concentrations in the water. And so based on that shipboard data, we can also then come up with an estimate of how much the reduction of CO2 outgassing happened over this region. And that is, again, a little bit uh, closer to what we have from OCO2. So again, based on theory, observations from the atmosphere, observations from the ocean, uh, and empirical estimates, we have a pretty good understanding that there is a reduction in CO2 outgassing that happened and we were able for the first time to able to see this from space. Now, what you might have been already asking is like, well, that's all well and fine that the reduction happened and we observed that, but then there is this large increase in CO2 concentrations. What caused that? There are sort of two main reasons for that. The first one is that there is an increase in emissions from biomass burning. This is shown in this maps here at the bottom where there are a huge, a large amount of fires that actually kick off over Indonesia and other uh, regions in that. Uh, uh, specifically, this is primarily over the Indonesian peat fires that happened in September, October 2015. And that's a pretty common phenomenon during El Nino events where we do have a lot more fires happening across the tropics because it's so dry and hot. Um, at the same time, because the overall climate is just warmer and drier, there is just a reduction in the biospheric uptake. And we can see that based on some of these NBE maps that you all have seen before, um, where we do see that across the tropics in 2015, 2016, there is just like a lot more red, which means a lot of a reduction in the land uptake. So both of those regions, or both of those reasons across the tropics, fires and reduction in biospheric uptake results in this increase that we see at the latter stages of an El Nino period. Um, this and a couple of other findings from OCO2, this all were actually featured prominently in Science Magazine uh, back in 2017. And so I would highly recommend that if you want to learn more about this unique findings that we got for the first time from space, on the 2015-2016 El Nino and the impact it had on the carbon cycle, then I would strongly recommend you to uh, look up this particular uh, resource and look through some of the papers uh, that came out during that time. At the same time, so the 2015-2016 El Nino, this is like a pretty big global event and has an imprint across the entire tropics. What about more regional impacts? Are we able to observe those? So one example that I have pointed out here is from a study by Byrne et al. in 2021 that actually looked at the bushfires that were happening over Southeast Australia in 2019-2020. Um, again, this image on the right here shows uh, the NASA satellite image showing all, all the different red spots or different fires that are burning. And then you can see a huge amount of emissions and smoke plumes uh, from those. Um, happening across entire Southeast Australia. So what Bynetol used was information from OCO2, but they had to combine it with other information such as uh, land use maps and understanding of like uh, land cover maps of where there are forested regions, where there are non-forested regions, and also information from MOPIT which is one of the sensors that actually measures atmospheric CO, so carbon monoxide concentrations, but which actually serves as a great indicator of fire anomalies. And what they did was put all of that information together into um, inverse modeling framework and then generate estimates of how much changes happen on the biospheric side of things due to these fires or bushfires in Southeast Australia. And the top plot here kind of shows these changes that happened over non-forested regions and uh, over forested regions. And for forested, again, you can break it up whether they were unburned, which is shown in the green lines, and whether they are burned, 
And essentially what we noted was that if we look at the time series of the GPP or the photosynthesis component during this period, then because of the fires, there is a huge reduction in that photosynthesis component because as the plants were burning, there was just more respiration that was happening and less photosynthesis. So this is again one great example uh, if you look at the study to show how surface atmosphere CO2 flux anomalies due to extreme events can be tracked from space. And we are using our scientists around the globe, they are using data from missions like OCO2 and OCO3 to quantify these differences in carbon cycle response and have a better understanding of any kind of land cover or land use um, or any type of management practices we need to implement to mitigate such events in the future. This sort of brings us to the final set of studies that I'm going to focus on, which relates to how the carbon cycle responds to anthropogenic perturbations. And the one or the most classical example that I'm going to take right now is related to the COVID-19 pandemic, which all of us have been through and all of us have are currently are still battling, I would say. The COVID-19 pandemic actually resulted in a huge amount of reduction in human emissions activity, at least during the initial period back in 2020 when lockdowns were being imposed around the globe. There were limitations that were put in on travel, other economic sectors, uh, for example, like uh, transportation and uh, as well as like the power industry, uh, as well as industries were closing down around the globe. All of this drastically decreased air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions within just a few weeks. And by some estimates, back in April 2020, April to May 2020, when this uh, emission reduction was at its peak, this reduced emissions by almost 15 to 20 percent. Now, the strongest impact of the COVID-19 lockdowns did happen from the transportation sector and Definitely, these did vary from country to country, as well as even within a country from sector to sector. And there is a great summary of all these changes that happened and which sectors had the biggest impact on human emissions activity in this uh, Lochner et al. paper in, from 2021. Now, a study that recently came out uh, from Weir et al., what they were interested in is understanding that as these lockdowns were being imposed and emission reductions were happening, did we have an imprint on that on atmospheric CO2 concentrations? In this case, what they did was do a level three type activity. So that is, they took the level two gap filled maps. Recall level two, level three. So they took the level two gap filled maps and then ran them through their model to generate the statistically uh, consistent gap filled level three maps that are shown in the panels B, C, and D. And then once they have generated this gap filled maps, they then looked at the anomalies between um, the CO2 concentrations for the 2019 2020 period or for this 2020 period and looked at against like a longer uh, time scale climatology based on previous OCO2 record from. Uh, the years preceding 2020. And they did this at sort of very specific country scales and then also tried to look at, at in those particular countries when lockdowns were imposed. And so on the panels that are shown here on the right, for these specific countries, for example, for China or for the United States and for Russia, what are also shown on this dashed markers here is when the lockdowns were imposed in the specific countries. And what they noted was that if we specifically look at some of those countries or even regions within those countries, and when and the timing of the lockdown, then we do see that as the lockdown progresses and as things are kind of completely shut down, there is actually a quite a big reduction in next year to concentrations. This is still pretty small because remember again, we are looking at the full column data. We are not looking at ground based data, but even then this is actually detectable above the noise in the XCO2 measurements. And the amount 
uh, and the detected magnitude of reduction in XCO2 concentrations, if we kind of were to convert that into some kind of a flux number, then that is consistent with the emission reductions that happen in that particular region. I would also point out that this anomaly and concentration maps, they are available on this dashboard that is jointly run by NASA, ESA, and JAXA, and the dashboard is still continuing. So if you want, you can visit this particular dashboard and then look at not just maps of CO2 and the anomaly reduction in CO2, but then at several other air quality and greenhouse gas indicators. Now, one of the more fascinating aspects is that, so we observed this reduction that happened early on in 2020, right? But then as time progressed and as things started opening up later in 2020, uh, and as well as 2021, there was this really heterogeneous mix of there were lockdowns imposed on some parts of the globe, but then other parts of the globe had already started opening up. If we, instead of looking at those very small time period when lockdowns were occurring, if we start looking at the annual means in terms of like overall what the annual growth rate in 2020 or the annual growth rate in 2021 was, what we notice is that it's a very small blip. At, like if you think about the rise in atmospheric CO2 concentrations that's happening all the way from the 60s or the 70s, then this change or reduction due to COVID-19 pandemic, that's a very small blip on that increasing trend. And we were fascinated when we looked at this and trying to understand that why didn't the COVID-19 pandemic result in a much larger change in atmospheric CO2 concentrations? And it turns out that this story becomes really complicated because as changes in fossil fuel emissions happened or reductions happened, that had an immediate impact on atmospheric CO2, but because there's already so much of CO2 concentrations around, that change or the magnitude of that change is relatively small. And as a result, it's a really small blip. Now, even as the magnitude of CO2 concentrations decreased, through our modeling simulations, what we are starting to see is that the response of the land and the ocean compartments also changed. If there is less CO2 in the atmosphere, then the land and the ocean also took up lower CO2 than what was expected of them. So kind of all given together, it turns out that the, as these changes in fossil fuel emissions happen, the response of the three major carbon reservoirs, the land, ocean, and atmosphere, all of them were different, extremely heterogeneous and quite varied. And passing out that change other than the lockdown period, if you look at this annual period, passing out that change ends up being really, really difficult. So there is a great paper on this uh, by Lovendusky et al. that actually captures some of these model simulations were done and what their findings were in terms of why, even though there were changes that happened during the lockdown, but then as we start looking at the annual time period, then the changes uh, are really, really small and quickly dissipate. And it's really hard to distinguish it from the natural variability. Another cool study that has been looking at the application of this XCO2 data uh, for different um, anthropogenic emissions is a study by Chevalier et al. that just recently came out uh, in 2022. And in this case, what Chevalier and his team, what they looked at were some of the large uh, point sources that are spread across the globe and whether missions or space-based missions like OCO2 and OCO3, whether they can actually monitor the emission from fossil fuel combustions around the world. So in this map, so if you look at the top map in OCO2, these dots, all of them represent locations where emissions from power plant or from some activity exceed one kiloton CO2 per hour. And then the red impulses on this maps illustrate the number of time when OCO2 actually sees those particular emissions as they are happening. It kind of flew over, sees that emissions as they are happening, and then correctly attributes it back uh, to that particular point. Um, OCO2 has a much longer time record, so almost seven and a half years of data went, or uh, seven years of data went in this map. 
and so it's able to recover a lot more of these large uh, point emitters whereas OCO3 has a much smaller record of only like two years at the or one one and a half years at the time of this analysis and hence it has uh, it is able to pick out some of the very large point emitters uh, but then also does miss some but between the two OCO2 and OCO3 taken together they are able to see almost 90% of this large point sources. Now this of course sort of launches us into uh, almost like the next training, uh, the next session that you will have, which will be about understanding this urban carbon emissions from space-based CO2 observations. That is an entirely fascinating and entirely great uh, topic on its own. And so I will, hope that you can all join us for that next particular session in order to learn about how we are using OCO2 and OCO3 measurements to understand uh, emissions over urban areas, megacities, and power plants. And this figure here again just shows uh, the OCO3 SAM mode. Remember at the very beginning we talked that there were three modes that are common to OCO2 and OCO3, Nadir, Target, and Glint, but then for OCO3 we have a fourth mode called SAM. So this picture here on the left panel actually shows an illustration of how the SAM mode operates. For example, we are looking at the Los Angeles megacity or the Los Angeles basin, and we have this like the swaths of measurements that are kind of taken over this region that then helps map out the emissions from this particular area. So just to summarize what we kind of learned today or what we uh, discussed, uh, CO2 monitoring from space, it's becoming an increasingly important and relevant capability, and particularly in support in the wake of the Paris Agreement and support of climate studies and to inform policy decisions. Now, what we have to remember is that the data that we collect from the satellites, even after filtering and bias correction, there are actually gaps in the data due to missing scenes or cloud and aerosol interference, etc. So what the scientific community uses instead is what are called as level three or gap filled maps and then level four, which are flux estimates generated from the level two data. And our majority of studies that we have, those actually end up using that level three or level four data. Now, on one hand, this level four or the flux maps, a primary use for them is to actually constrain the net biosphere exchange between the land and ocean surface and the atmosphere. And these estimates in conjunction with fossil fuel estimates and other bottom up emission inventories, they are now being used to inform the UNFCCC global stock take process. But in general, just from a scientific value itself, these flux maps are providing us with huge understanding about spatial and temporal variation in CO2 exchange between the land and the ocean and the atmosphere. Of course, the other big application for the XCO2 data that we saw is trying to understand the carbon cycle response to different types of either natural perturbation, like an El Nino event, or if there were droughts or huge fire events that happen, or what we call as the human-induced or anthropogenic perturbation in this case, it was a case study of the COVID-19 pandemic when there were reductions in fossil fuel emissions, and that actually resulted in an impact on the CO2 concentrations that we observed. Both the El Nino and the COVID-19 pandemic case studies that we discussed in detail, these are really sort of classic case studies, and they are demonstrating how we can use the CO2 data to advance our geophysical understanding of carbon cycle science. So the last slide that I have here, and I would strongly encourage all of you, once you have downloaded the PDF, to take a look at some of these studies, are um, some of the ones that I mentioned throughout this discussion or throughout this training session. Um, the, all of these provide a great insight into OCO2 and OCO3 operations, uh, uh, information content in the data, and how we can use them for advancing carbon cycle science. Um, I'll also, have here the different data repositories for level two, for the level three gap filled estimates. This is like one of the data products that we do release uh, and is publicly available. And then also the level four carbon flux estimates, which are derived from an ensemble of inversion models, again, as part of the OCO 
multi inter comparison project or the MIP activity, there are these flux estimates and flux maps that you can go and check out at this link. And with that, I'm happy to conclude this training session. And I'm really looking forward uh, to the question and answers uh, and the discussions that we'll have. I do hope that all of you have now a better understanding uh, of how we can use the XCO2 information, all the different types of studies at different space and time scales that uh, people have been looking at, the scientists have been looking at, and hopefully also get an understanding that if you are interested in using the XCO2 data, what type of application you can really use this data for. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chatterjee, for that a great presentation. And thank you to all the participants for joining in and for uh, writing your questions in the questions window. We've been gathering some of those questions, or uh, actually all of the questions, into a Google Doc that we will be sharing with you uh, here. And we will go through each of the questions. Uh, so. Uh, let's just start from the top and Dr. Chatterjee, as well as the rest of the OCO2 and OCO3 team members are online to answer these questions. So let's just start from the very top. And also, as you have questions, please write them in the questions uh, window. All right, so the first one, can you please elaborate on the relation and connection between OCO and AIRS? What is AIRS? How does it measure greenhouse gas, gases and carbon? How does it compare or complement OCO measurements? Thank you, Erica. And thank you for whoever provided that question. That's actually, uh, this is a great uh, question. So before I jump into the main answer, uh, let me start by reminding everyone of something we learned during the very first training session, and that is how do we measure CO2 from space? The basic idea is that we are looking at a high resolution spectra of sunlight reflecting from or the thermal radiation emitted by the Earth's surface and atmosphere, and it is this spectra that is carrying information about the thermal structure and composition of the atmosphere. We look at the spectra from all this from the our orbiting spacecraft and then analyzing it, analyze it with different algorithms to yield information about the atmosphere, including the distribution of uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Now the AIRS instrument, which was sort of really one of the first multipurpose instruments that we had in space, that basically uses the thermal infrared observations or the thermal infrared band to retrieve the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. OCOs, on the other hand, looks at the near infrared spectra. Now, because these two spectra are in two different regions or the wave or the spectra bands, what ends up happening is that here's the information that it has about CO2 that is typically more related to the middle to the upper troposphere. Uh, so it's more sensitive to CO2 concentrations in the middle to upper troposphere of the atmosphere. Um, it also has a pretty large uh, footprint uh, and in general, sort of the initial attempts at trying to do the retrieval from of the CO2, that yielded precisions which were really not better than one to two percent so the errors were of the order of like two ppm or larger also because these measurements are not very sensitive to the surface but rather they are sensitive to the mid to upper troposphere it wasn't giving us much information about the fluxes that were occurring near the surface and so while this was sort of a great first demonstration of how we could take CO2 measurements from space, what scientists and researchers who are looking at the data quickly realized was that it wasn't really providing a great constraint on the flux exchange happening between the surface and the atmosphere. This is where the more new age sensors like OCO comes into the picture. Because OCO is looking at the near infrared band, it's able to provide a much uh, greater information and a much greater constraint 
on the exchange of fluxes that are occurring near the surface. It is also provides measurements with a much improved accuracy and precision. So right now, the errors that we see in our retrievals, they're of the order of one ppm or even lower. And so that I would say it's sort of like where the difference between errors and OCO lies. Um, there are still algorithm improvements. I, I would note that there are still algorithmic improvements that are happening on the errors retrieval. And so the errors are still lower. But again, just because of the fundamental differences in the spectra that those two instruments look at, we end up with two different pieces of information about CO2 in the atmosphere. There are also studies that are actually trying to combine the information of, uh, from the two and provide a greater constraint, but those studies are still uh, ongoing. The, that type of research and investigations, they are still ongoing. Great, thank you. Question number two, is NBE in terms of inverse modeling the same as NEE, net ecosystem exchange, measured by the eddy covariance technique? They are very similar, yes, but they're not exactly identical. And the reason is this, uh, the net ecosystem exchange that is taken by the eddy covariance technique, that is primarily looking at exchange of flux exchange that is happening within a very small footprint. So typically the footprint of the eddy covariance towers, they are around one kilometer. So it's being able to tell us the flux exchange that is happening between that small area. The NBE on the other hand that we derive from these atmospheric measurements, um, these atmospheric measurements again span the total column. So it actually tells us about the flux exchange that's happening, uh, the natural flux exchange that's happening like photosynthesis and respiration. But then if there are other processes that are occurring within that domain, so for example, like any kind of land use change or some kind of other deforestation or some other uh, burning uh, biofuel or biomass burning that's happening, the atmosphere is an integrator. And so it's integrating all of that information together and thus providing us a sense of the flux exchange happening due to all those processes. Now, if, for example, we take the atmospheric measurements and then uh, in, in the future, if we could, for example, pick each retrieval by retrieval by itself, and then just do an inversion for one single sounding over a particular tower, if there are no other uh, processes that are occurring in that domain other than photosynthesis and respiration, then yes, in theory, the NBE would be equal to the NEE. But in practical terms, there is a difference between those two terms. Okay, question number three. In slide 16, why is cement separated from fossil fuel and cement emissions? What fossil fuel emissions are used in the inverse modeling? Are they spatially gridded data or national level data? Great question. Um, so this has a little bit to do, I mean, I would say there is a little bit of a historical reason why we end up doing fossil fuel and cement emissions together. So currently the information that we get about fossil fuel, those are primarily compiled from inventories. Uh, and those are based on data that we obtain from production, consumption, and trade of fossil fuels, uh, as well as different processes that can contribute to th this extra CO2 emissions, like the production of cement. Now, a lot of this inventories and data that we collect, those are, uh, sort of reports that are provided by different countries or by different international organizations. And of, as of at least, I would say a few years back, a lot of them actually only reported uh, the production of fossil fuel that just involves fossil fuel combustion. So only like the oil and gas uh, burning or uh, et cetera they would not include any kind of information about exchange of bunker fuels or, for example, cement production, which is actually not due to fossil fuel combustion. So 
primarily because of this, uh, we kind of started where we had fossil fuel production database, and then we would get a different database for cement production, and then those would be combined. A lot of the newer inventories that are now being produced, they actually do gather data from fossil fuel and cement together. Um, and then all of that data is reported together in the current, uh, recent inventories. And uh, in this document, I have actually pointed you to two different inventories that we look at. Um, the first one is uh, called as this ODAC or open source data inventory for anthropogenic CO2 that actually provides estimates graded at like one degree, even 10 kilometers. And then for uh, specific regions, it even has data providing uh, data at one kilometer. So really high resolution. Um, but you can also obtain country level fossil fuel CO2 emission estimates. And those are available as part of the CDAC FF. And I have pointed out the reference there, uh, both the published paper as well as from the published paper you can go to where the data is held in the repository and access that. Okay, thank you. Question number four, what is BBE in Philip et al 2022 on slide number 20? Uh, that just refers to the biomass burning emissions. It's uh, I apologize that in the figure, yeah, it was just the acronym that was presented, BBE. But if you look at the paper, um, then it is just referring to the biomass burning emissions. Okay, question number five. Can we use XCO2 and XCO3 data or OCO2 and OCO3 data? I think that's what they mean. To map data on carbon stocks and fluxes in four mangrove carbon pools above ground biomass, below ground biomass, soil, and dead organic matter? So the OCO2 and OCO3 data, again, will provide information about the net exchange of fluxes that are occurring above your mangrove carbon pool. So for example, let's say you have selected a mangrove area, and I'm trying to think of an example, uh, let's say like the Everglades in the US or like the Sundarbans and India and Bangladesh. Over that entire region, what's the exchange of fluxes that are happening? You can get an estimate of that. Now, again, in theory, if you actually are able to map and exchange those fluxes, uh, the exchange of fluxes that happens at net exchange, that does map to a net change in carbon stocks. And those carbon stocks are then related to sort of the four pools that you have mentioned here, that the above ground biomass, uh, the below ground soil and dead organic matter. So just the data by itself will give you a understanding of the net flux exchange, but then you will need another framework or some other ancillary data that you need to bring in to convert that exchange of net fluxes to the net changes in carbon stocks. Um, but in general, if you are looking to uh, get data on carbon stocks uh, in general, then sort of there are other space based instruments um, like JEDI is currently one that's flying on the International Space Station um, or Landsat, uh, which again has a very long history and long tradition. So there are other sensors and other satellite data that you can use. Okay, question number six. And actually the person that posted this question later said that um, his question had been answered, but maybe you just wanna to touch on this. It says, how do the OCO2 products work with wildfire as mentioned in the earlier slide about Australia wildfire? Mm -hmm. So the OCO2 products, so in general, if there is a fire happening, let's say a wildfire is happening in some part of the globe, then there is this huge emission in terms of like smoke and ash plume. When OCO2 flies over that area, typically because there is such a thick cloud and smoke cover, we are not able to directly get any retrieval over where that fire is happening. But just downwind from that fire where the air has cleared a little bit, but there's still going to be a very high enhancement in 
uh, atmospheric CO2 concentrations, as well as carbon monoxide concentrations. We use that information of that enhancement in CO2 and CO to then back out the emissions that are coming from the fire. And that is sort of like one of the main principles that was used in that uh, Brendan Burns paper, uh, the Burn et al. paper. Um, and several other studies have kind of looked at, for example, California wildfires or other places and try to get that enhancement in CO2 due to the fire and then get an understanding of how much CO2 emissions actually happened. Okay, question number seven. Can you please share how we can access the ground measurements, uh, the ground measurement data and sensors in slide 20, measurements from ground-based sites, the in-situ network? Sure, yeah, and I saw this question and I already posted a response to that. So um, the ground-based measurement network, these are run by different organizations across the globe. Uh, our colleagues at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, Global Monitoring Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado, they essentially uh, work with all of these different agencies and organizations to gather all of that data, do several layers of quality control and quality checks on them, package them, and then release that package data for ease of use. So I have posted a link to one of those packages. Um, they do this not just for CO2 concentrations, as we are talking here, but for also uh, methane, as well as some other uh, carbon and greenhouse gas species. Uh, so yeah, please go and check out that link. It's a great resource uh, for getting all of the data in one place. Great, thank you for that. Question number eight. This is uh, regarding the use of the word sounding in OCO2 data. So what is a sounding? Is it analogous to the radio sound sounding? Um, no, I guess, I mean, in our satellite parlance, I would say uh, soundings typically just mean like one retrieval or one measurement at a point. Uh, so we typically say a single sounding, which basically means a single retrieval uh, happening over a particular uh, spot. I hope that answers the question. There might be um, some. Yeah, whoever asked that question, if you have any follow up questions, then please feel free to put it in the Q&A doc. Great. Question number nine. Can you please clarify how OCO identifies CO2 plumes from large source points? What is the accuracy and granularity? Which example sources were detected and over what time scale? Great question. Um, so again, the way we identify CO2 plumes from large point sources, so whether we are flying over a power plant or over an urban area or mega city, in general, it is very similar to what I mentioned about how we calculate the CO2 enhancement from the wildfire um, example. So, for example, if we just went over a power plant emission, then we would be looking down uh, and getting a measurement of the total CO2 concentration. Now, if we just compare it to the retrievals that are taken uh, pretty close by, but not directly over that power plant, by differencing the two retrievals, you would get a sense of the enhancement uh, that you see in the CO2 concentration. And then we use some model of atmospheric transport uh, specifically to get the winds. So we know that which direction the wind is blowing. And we use that information along with the enhancement in XCO2 to back out how much uh, CO2 emissions are happening over that particular source. Um, in terms of which sources can be de uh, detected, um, so the accuracy, first of all, the accuracy, I mean, in general right now for OCO2, typically the measurements are accurate to less than one ppm. And when we fly over a power plant or any of these large sources, the enhancement there in XCO2 is much larger than one ppm. Uh, so for sure, we are able to detect that uh, change. Um, 
in terms of which sources can be detected. So that again then depends upon like the size of the power plant. So for example, a particular uh, study that I'd shown that was recently conducted uh, by uh, Chevalier et al. They specifically looked at sources that release more than one kiloton CO2 per hour. Um, and that is just based on, again, like if you think about the one PPM accuracy and how much of a flux it can detect, it is just based on that you have to have enough of a large emission that we, when we fly over it, we look at it and then compare it against something in the background and we are able to detect that change. Um, uh, right now, based on uh, for both OCO2 and OCO3, uh, studies are indicating that typically we are able to see any of the largest like thermal power plants uh, that are there across the globe. Uh, we are able to actually observe emissions from those pretty easily. Super. Okay, question 10. What is the temporal and spatial resolution of the CO2 raster layer? Hmm, I am curious. I'm not sure I completely understand what is meant by the CO2 raster layer. So I believe this would be like a level three product. What would be the temporal? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. uh, for the so the level three product that I showed um, in my presentation and the link that I have posted to where it's publicly available, the spatial resolution is 0 0.5 degree. So um, 0 0.5 degree, I would say roughly kind of ends up being around 50 kilometer along the tropics, uh, 50 kilometer grid boxes. And then the temporal resolution is that uh, there, these are daily products, uh, but then they are also aggregated and available at a monthly time resolution. Great, okay. So the daily products, it's not complete global coverage though, correct? Uh, it is complete global coverage, yes, because okay. That's what the level three product does, right? It, it creates this scaffold maps. So even if, for example, it is like, let's say uh, we take January. So that's like Northern hemisphere winter. And just because of the sun geometry, sun angle geometry and solar zenith angle constrictions, we are not necessarily able to observe directly over Fairbanks, Alaska, for example. We don't get any measurements there. Um, but because the capital map takes, it uses information from some prior estimate from a model and then combines it with the retrieval from OCO2, it mixes those two information. It will still provide uh, uh, an estimate of what the CO2 should be over Fairbanks, Alaska. Okay. So yes, it is, it is the level three maps end up providing like global coverage. Okay, great. All right, so we move on to question number 11. Does OCO2 provide separate level four NBE and NCE products? And how are the two set, how are the two data sets, I guess, differentiated given that they are products of an integrated atmosphere? Yeah, so that's sort of like what I had referred to in my terminology slide. And I'll also refer um, whoever has this question to the previous RSA training that we had on global stock take, because there we do get into a lot of details about the net biosphere exchange versus the net carbon exchange. Um, the short answer is that in preparation for the global stock take, that is happening right now, um, or, and the OCO2 team is participating in that. And as part of that, yes, we are providing separate level four NBE and NCE products. Uh, those are country level estimates. In general, to just go from the NBE to NCE, all that we are doing is adding in fossil fuel emissions, as well as bringing in information about different lateral fluxes. Um, that have, 
lateral exchanges that happen. So the information about fossil fuel, again, we get that based on inventories, then some of the exchanges about lateral fluxes, like example, the transfers of carbon that happen due to movement of wood products or grazing and crop products. Uh, those are again brought in from model based estimates. Uh, but again, I would strongly refer to the previous RSET training that we have because there are a lot more details on the calculation of these two terms. Um, there are also some exercises and data that's already made available as part of that training. Great. And we can put a link to that training here as part mm -hmm. of the response to this question. So question number 12, can you please elaborate on the ability to monitor town scale or city scale CO2 emissions? Yes, uh, so certainly we are very well able to uh, monitor and detect, quantify uh, any kind of emissions that are happening over urban areas, uh, like whether they are large cities, uh, what we call as mega cities typically. So for example, the entire Los Angeles metropolitan area or over Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, Paris, France, some of these really large domains. Um, we are, the next session that we will have as part of this training will exclusively talk about monitoring the what we call as like these urban emissions quantifying urban anthropogenic co2 emissions and so there will be a lot more case studies that will be uh, shown and discussed in that session of which will be on thursday so i hope you're able to attend that um but yes absolutely we are able to monitor um, cities and towns very well again the constraints being that we, I mean, our constraints are always cloud cover. So for example, if it's very cloudy, so one of the very um, specific cases I would say would be Mumbai in India, where during the monsoon season, you do have a lot of cloud cover. And so during the monsoon season, then we do see gaps uh, in our retrievals. But that's again where something like a level three product comes into play because then they're able to use prior information from models along with any limited retrievals we might have to generate this gap fill maps uh, over uh, the domain. Great. Okay, so that is the last question. I guess there is one more that just came in. Any hands-on for downloading and processing level three and level four data? Right now, we do not have that in our plan, but I, uh, we have been really excited to see this response that we have had to this training. And I believe that we are discussing or we are thinking about on the future training where we could cover um, the level three and level four products in more detail and how to download and access them. Karen, if you are still online, do you want to speak to that? Uh, sure. Um, we haven't made any plans because obviously, well, when I say made any plans through our set, I think um, we have, we would have to work with the our set team as far as um, the timing for doing something like this. However, uh, this sort of feedback, like we have been gathering the questions that people have been ha um, providing us, um, this gives us a very good indication of how we would move things um, next. And definitely this was a beginner, uh, certainly the training from last week, it was a beginner session and I look forward to being able to do a more intimate immediate level one. So it will really be up to, uh, I don't want to put um, folks on the spot because there's a schedule, you know, to do these trainings, but we'll definitely get ready for the, 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 the next step. So please be on the lookout for that. We, and, and keep your questions and comments coming. That helps us a lot informing what we will put together in the actual training. So thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Karen. So I just wanted to remind all of the participants that at the end of this training, you will receive a link for a survey for this training. And as Karen mentioned, it's always great to get your feedback about um, what you would like to see in future trainings related to XCO2. So it can help inform our next training, which would probably will which would build on what was presented in this first one, and it would be more of an intermediate type training. Great. So with that, that that concludes the questions. There is a comment about the Q and A documents. We will be putting the posting the Q&A documents for the previous sessions on our website um, shortly within the next couple of days. So please be on the lookout for that. And uh, just to remind everyone that we have one more session uh, that will be on Thursday at the same time. It will be by Dr. John Lim from University of Utah. And he'll be talking more about the use of OCO2 and OCO3 data for local scale studies um, specifically at the at the city scale so please uh, that, that's going to be another great session please don't miss it uh, so before we close i would like to thank uh, the rset team selwyn hudson adoy jonathan o'brien sarah kutschel and um, i would uh, of course uh, like to thank all of the participants for your uh, questions great questions and enthusiasm about this topic and uh, last but not least, the uh, guest speaker, Dr. Abhishek Chatterjee, uh, for his great presentation and sharing all of his expertise today. So before we close, uh, Dr. Chatterjee, would you like to say any final words? Um, just that, yeah, I just wanted to again thank all the participants for joining in and listening to the session. And my email address is provided in this document. So if you have further questions or need further information or have clarification about a topic or a particular study that was conducted, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I certainly look forward to people, more and more people using the OCA2 and OCA3 data for their scientific investigations. And uh, also thank you, Erica, um, Karen, and then the entire ARSA team for helping out. Um, so yeah, overall a great session and look forward to hearing the feedback and further questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. And thank you to Karen Yuen for, for being here today and answering um, some of the questions as well. So that concludes this session. Uh, wishing everyone a, a great day and see, see you all on uh, Thursday for the final session of this series. Bye-bye everyone. Bye now. Thanks, Erica. Bye. Thank you. Bye.